All right. A few years ago, I remember being here on the floor, and the then Democrat leader got behind the microphone and basically called those of us who made it very clear we would not vote for a clean debt ceiling arsonists. And that has bothered me ever since because I think actually in many ways those of us who did not believe in a clean debt ceiling, raising the debt ceiling once again without some attempt to slow the chaos, slow the spending down, I actually think those of us who wanted to bend the debt curve, we weren't the arsonists. We were actually in some ways the fire prevention crew. We were trying to save the country, save the society. So, first off, does everyone understand how bad the math is? We're functionally borrowing $47,000 every second. We borrow $2,841,000 a minute. Okay, so I'm going to speak for what, a half an hour? $2,800,000 is $84,000. $84, $84 million in the half an hour I'm going to speak is going to be borrowed. $84 million will be borrowed during the half an hour I speak. But we're functionally borrowing over $4 billion every single day. And we're not heading towards ever paying this off. And the perverse thing, do you understand, in a decade, that number almost doubles. It almost doubles. And for, back to the rhetoric of arson, go back over our history over the last 50 years. The only times, well, except for one where, God bless them, in the 80s, they actually took on the shortfalls in Social Security. But you look at the different deals that have been made to bend the debt curve, almost every single one was associated with a debt ceiling. It was that one stressor We've all heard over and over and over, Congress will not do something unless they feel the pressure, unless they feel there's a crisis, unless they're up against the wall. And the game that was played here is saying, oh, let's change the rules for the Senate. Let's make it so they can do it 50 votes, and that way we can just pass this. We don't have to deal with the reality of the burying of people's future retirements and destroying my little girl's future in debt. We can just avoid it and go home and have a nice Christmas. But the fact of the matter is almost every agreement we've had has been associated with the stressor that was brought on by a debt ceiling. Graham Rudman, 1985, and functionally again in 87. Debt limit increase associated with it. Deficit reduction and automatic spending and budget triggers. Paygo. I can't tell you how many times I've had Democrats here preach PAYGO to me, except for the fraud that PAYGO really is, where, hey, on the fifth year, we'll just pretend it no longer costs anything, therefore it doesn't fall under the PAYGO rules. But the PAYGO rules, functionally, every time, four times, was associated with changing the borrowing limits of the country, the debt ceiling. It was supposed to create deficit reduction, and it did create some. Spending increases must be offset, and that is the ultimate cultural change that PAYGO produced. But remember, it came about because of a debt ceiling fight, multiple debt ceiling fights. Budget Control Act, you remember how controversial this one was. We had actually a government shutdown and other things associated with this. But. The Budget Control Act, sequestration that came with that, if you look at it, was the most successful in modern times of bending the spending curve. The problem is it's all discretionary, and we all know the fraud around here is discretionary is now down to, what, 10% or so? Well, actually, no, 15% of what we actually spend if you strip military out. Military is now 10%, rest of discretionary 15%. The other 70 plus percent is functionally on autopilot. But this is the truth. 
And once again, the, the left, look, Democrats have control of this place. They control the White House, they control the Senate, they control the House. Okay, bless their precious hearts. But we could have used this as a stressor and there would have been lots of, oh, my hair is on fire, the world's coming to the end, I'm worried about the stock market, oh, wink, wink, nod, nod, and the stock market just goes on because they know we'll fix something. But used it as an excuse, even if we have to tell our constituents why we're trying to do something tough. Because remember, the lobbyists here in this town aren't here to help us reduce spending, they're here with their hands out wanting more spending. This place is functionally, structurally designed to get everything you can and hell be damned one day when we hit that failed bond auction. And you all saw today, it wasn't a big deal, but today's bond auction was slightly un undersubscribed when U.S. sovereign debt was being sold. I'm not saying it's a canary in a mine, but the canary did have a little cough. And so here's what we're going to do today. I think the Senate may be voting at this moment. We're just functionally going to do a debt increase, probably what, we come back, what, on Tuesday? We still don't know what the number is going to be. Or maybe we do the fraud of just do it to a date. Will there be any deficit reduction, any attempt, any, any dis, any, anything to force some rational math of what's going on? No, because it's uncomfortable because we have to tell the truth about the drivers of our debt. And what is the drivers of our debt? Okay, I have said this over and over and over, but we need to be honest. The left will say, oh, it's military. It's, it's rich people not paying enough taxes. The right, we have our sins too. We'll say, oh, it's foreign aid. It's, um, oh, 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 it's, it's, foreign, it's waste and fraud. No, it's not. The primary driver of U.S. sovereign debt is we are getting old. It's demographics. And demographics isn't Republican or Democrat. It's math. And, and you've got to understand how sharp this curve is. We are functionally right here. So here's 2022. We're functionally, let's say, 17% of our population is over 65 today. You do see how fast we start getting up to close to 22% of our population being over 65. This is the driver of our debt. Remember the math, and I'm going to do it a couple times here, and I'm sorry this upsets people because they don't want us to tell the truth. Primary driver of U.S. sovereign debt is Medicare. Simply Medicare, and then Social Security, and the rest of the budget actually is in balance. Through the next 30 years, the rest of the budget is actually in balance. It's demographics. If you made a pledge when you ran for office around here that you were going to protect people's retirement, you are going to protect Social Security, you are going to protect Medicare, letting it be buried in debt. How's that protecting it? Tell the truth. And there are solutions. I've come behind this mic so many times and said, there's technology out there. There's things we can do to crash the price of health care. There's policies we can do to grow the economy. Everything should be fixated on what maximizes economic growth. And then the left moves something, their build back better, their social entitlement spending, that the data says it slows down the economy. We will be poorer and smaller, and the working poor will be poorer at the end of the decade because the way they design their social entitlement spending legislation, we're doing everything half-assed backwards. If you lay out sort of the holistic theory, you know, sort of the integrated model, yeah, you've got to fix immigration, but you, got to, you focus on immigration being about maximizing economic expansion, not importing poverty. Adoption of technology that maximizes people being healthy and cures, cures, cures. Remember last week we came here and talked about the miracle from last week that we've cured someone of type 1 diabetes. Because remember, 31% of all of our spending in Medicare is just type 2 diabetes. What happens if you would do cures and in people's misery? Oh, by the way, you get amazing benefits on our debt. The immediate reaction you'll get from people on the left is, well, Schweiker got behind the mic and wanted to cut entitlements. No, I'm trying to find a way to save them. But you save them by changing the cost curve 
you save them by having a moment. Pretend you're at a 12-step group. Isn't the first step to admit you have a problem? This place can't make it to step one. So let's do a little math. And I'm sorry, I do this over and over, but I, I continue to be just shocked the number of staff around here will grab me in the elevator and say, is that number real? Is this real? And you say, this is the single biggest issue policy-wise facing Washington, facing this country, and we will chase shiny objects because shiny objects don't make your brain hurt. We will have asinine discussions about, oh, there's a vaccine database, there's this, there's that. And you realize it's a con. That is part of the scam this place does is look at the shiny object, we can chase that because this hurts. Reality, and this number is worse today. This is based on last year's math. $112 trillion inflation adjusted public borrowing in 29 years. $112 trillion of borrowing will be our publicly held debt in 29 years, 77.7 .7 of that is just Medicare. 34.8 is Social Security. The rest of the federal budget is in balance. This is just demographics. The cure is economic growth and crashing the price of health care. This will drive every bit of public policy and it's coming very fast. If you look at our borrowing curve, in a decade we go from what's projected sort of these days where we're going to be borrowing a trillion dollars a year to a couple trillion dollars a year. The debt will and the borrowing will and the interest will drive all policy. And this place right now there's more policy worried about how to get reelected than saving the country in the future. Do you understand, do you understand a two-point increase in interest rates from nominal interest rates that have been projected? If we go up just 2%, and that's getting us actually closer to what the historic mean is. In 2051, 100% of revenues, 100% of revenues, 100% of revenues Go just to pay interest. How come this isn't the number one discussion here? Now the left may have different ways to approach it than those of us on the right, but you would think it, this would be all we could talk about. And it's avoided around here like the virus. Except we haven't figured out how to put a mask on it and give it social distancing, have we? And for my brothers and sisters on the left, the number of times I will try to sit down in working groups with my Democrat colleagues, and I believe their heart may be in the right place. They don't own a calculator, their math isn't there, but, but you know, we make public policy by our feelings in this place. We make public policy because it feels good, it has a great title, we get judged by our intentions, not by our outcomes. And that's incredibly dangerous. So think about some of the, the rhetoric. This board, and, and I've done presentations here where I walk through every single revenue, what the proper term is receipts, generating proposal from the left. And if you did all of them and pretended they had no economic effects, no secondary effects, all of them, you can't still raise, come close to raise enough revenues. Even a 100% tax rate on small businesses and upper income families could not come close to balancing the long-term budget. You can take all the rich people's money and all the revenues from those small businesses that they own. You can take every dime. This is a percentage of GDP number. When you get into these sorts of numbers, you start doing the percentage of GDP. We are heading towards 15% of GDP functioning being borrowing. And if you take every dime, you only get about 5% of GDP.
we're screwed. If, and I'm sorry, I know that's crass, but I, I just don't know how to get folks to want to pay attention to it. This is the single most important thing going on here is if you care about education, if you care about health, if you care about science, if you care about space, if you care about you know, equality, if you care about these things, when there's no more money, when every dime of resources goes so we survive and do our best to avoid that failed bond auction, which God forbid if it does, an interest rate spike. Do you have any idea how fragile we've made our society? And this isn't off in the future. This is today. We will kiss up close to, what is it, 30 trillion in borrowing. Probably in the next few months. These are unthinkable numbers. And it's here. And this, and God understand, these projections are based in this concept, a really simple one. There's going to be no more wars. There's not going to be another pandemic. There's not going to be an economic collapse. There's not going to be a mortgage collapse. We've done this to ourselves. And then the left comes here and we do things like the Build Back Better, the social spending bill, which ultimately, and, and we have different number because God knows what the Senate's going to do. But the simple scoring from CBO basically said at year five, it's borrowed another $800 billion. Oh, by the way, wink, wink, nod, nod. After year five, we'll actually stop all these programs and we'll start to raise revenues to pay it off. We're functionally going to add another $4 trillion plus from borrowing. Mr. Speaker, may I ask for the time? <clears throat> the gentleman has six minutes remaining. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The social spending bill. At the end of the decade, you realize the economy will have missed tremendous amounts of economic growth. Some of the best models coming from the Tax Foundation, we're actually making ourselves poor because of the design of the spending. When you tell people, I'm going to send you a check, but you don't have to work when I'm putting money into things that don't actually create a productivity. And remember, what are the two ways you pay people more money? Inflation, well, that doesn't get you anywhere, or productivity. That was one of the miracles of the end of the 2017 tax reform is the resources that went for companies to buy equipment to be more productive so they could pay their workers more, and you saw it. You saw a miracle of employment and wage growth. And then the cynicism that when two-thirds of millionaires get tax cuts under the Democrats' Build Back Better plan. So you tell us the rich need to pay their fair share, and then you design pieces of legislation that give hundreds of billions of dollars to rich people. And then you tell us, oh, by the way, we should put state and local back into it, but the most of it goes to really rich people. I mean, come on, if you want to do something, okay, you want revenues. We did a whole presentation here a few months ago that said we can show you over 10 years $1.4 trillion you can get. Stop subsidizing really, really rich people. Instead, the left does a piece of legislation to subsidize them more. I mean, I guess my intense frustration is We are heading, it may not be the bubble where the economy blows up, but we are heading to a type of rot because so much of this nation's resources will be used to survive the amount of debt we've piled up. And then we're adopting policies that don't create any type of escape philosophy of we're curing diseases that drive the debt because most of the debt is driven by health care. We're doing investments in things that grow the economy. We're getting immigration codes and regulatory codes and other things. We're modernizing them so they maximize economic opportunity because we actually give a darn about poor people. We give a darn about the working poor. We give a darn about people who are heading towards retirement. We give a darn about young people having a future. And not one of those things is actually in the math. It's in the rhetoric. People spin some great stories here. 
but it's not in the math, Mr. Speaker. It's just not in the math. It's not in the economic analysis. The universities that have looked at what's going on right now tell us at the end of the decade, the poor are going to be poorer. Come on, what type of economic violence is this will place willing to subject the working poor, the middle class to? We're better than this. And there is a path. You're not going to pay off the debt, Mr. Speaker, but we could adopt enough policies to flatten the curve that my six-year-old daughter actually has a future. And doesn't she deserve one? And with that, I yield back, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 4th, 2021, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Roy, for 30 minutes. I thank the Speaker. I want to thank my friend from Arizona for being willing to stand on the floor of the United States House of Representatives when, unfortunately, so many of my colleagues are not this evening to talk about the danger facing our country. And the gentleman outlines, if I believe I'm correct, that we'll be facing $112 trillion of debt come 2050 if we do not change course, if we do not take the steps necessary to make changes with respect to our health care spending and make wise policy choices. Like any family, any budget that, uh, that you have to maintain if you're running a business, a nonprofit, a university, Virtually everybody in the world, or at least everybody in this country, except for this body right here, that has to maintain and balance a budget and make determinations and make tough choices. If the gentleman would indulge me for a minute or two, for a couple more minutes on the floor, when was the last time, if the gentleman recalls, we've had the ability to amend a piece of legislation on the floor of this body? <laughs> Truly amend it. Does the gentleman remember? Will, will the gentleman yield? I will. You know, brilliant question. And, and for, I cannot actually think of something that was substantive, where there was a collective idea from, from my brothers and sisters on the left or the right, that there was actual intellectual battle here where we made something better. This place is functionally a intellectual dictatorship. Would it surprise the gentleman that it was May of 2016, the last time that an amendment was offered on the floor of this body in open debate. Now, to be clear, that is an assessment of leadership in both parties. But how on earth can we actually solve the problems, I would ask the speaker, if we don't come down and sit at this table and stop looking up at the C-SPAN cameras and just sit around this table and start with a budget, like any family or any business, and say, here's how much money we have. Here's how we can responsibly spend for the betterment of the people, have disagreements about what those priorities are, and make choices. When was the last time that we've done that? It's a rhetorical question, but I know one data point is that May of 2016 was the last time that any member of this body was able to walk onto this floor and offer an amendment that wasn't pre-cooked up in rules previously and already set up by the leadership structure of either party. Would the gentleman agree that that is no way for the people's house to operate? Will the gentleman allow me just a quick colloquy with him? Yes, sir. The process is broken. It's why I come here almost every week, and you do too, and we try to just focus on what's ahead of us. And, and look, no, I just spent a half an hour sort of focusing on debt and deficit. That's not Republican or Democrat. It's what's ahead of us. You've been here a few years. years. How many actual real discussions, other than theater of we should do a study commission, we should write a strongly worded memo, the theater of this place, instead of doing what's really hard and understand you can't just do one thing. That's the great fraud now. We've gotten ourselves in such a difficult position. It's got to be everything. You know, um, a couple years ago I came here and we brought in 19 attributes that you had to do almost at the exact same time to maximize enough economic growth, enough technology disruption, all the things to make it work. You actually helped me on some of that. 
But my fear, those are really uncomfortable and you'll have an army of lobbyists really unhappy with you when you tell the truth about the math. Well, the, the gentleman is completely correct and there's no debate about that. You want to have a conversation about solving the Medicare crisis driving $112 trillion, then you have to have a conversation about solving the health care crisis. And to solve the health care crisis, you need to actually be willing, both sides of the aisle, to take on the army of lobbyists representing the insurance companies, the hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, all minting money right now, by the way, literally minting money. And you got to be willing to have a conversation about that to actually figure out how we can transform our healthcare system to be patient-centered, doctor-centered, and not have to go to an insurance bureaucrat or a government bureaucrat to figure out what your healthcare looks like, and then get competition, transparency, and drive down prices. Because if you drive down prices, we can actually solve the Medicare crisis. The gentleman knows in, in many quarters I'm a bit of a heretic on this. Mm. I actually believe we're on the cusp of miracles. If it's true that we just found a cure for type 1 diabetes, mm -hmm. if it's, the math is true, about one third of all US healthcare spending is just type 2 diabetes. For my Native American populations, for my urban poor, for my rural Anglo poor, the amount of diabetes, the misery, the suffering, wouldn't it be one of the most elegant, noble things we could do is say, screw this noise we're doing, we're going to do our Operation Warp Speed. We now th we see there's a stem cell to an islet, to the islet producing insulin. There is a path, but it requires intellectual discipline, telling the truth, and saying no to a lot of people who are going to be upset because a cure ends the misery. It also mends the manipulation. Well, I would agree with the gentleman, and, and I hope that we can reach a point where, to your point, you asked me a question about how many times we had a real substantive debate. The closest I can remember was I made this point about amendments on the floor of the House and Steny, or the gentleman from Maryland, the leader, said uh, in an agreement, yeah, I, I wish we had more debate on the floor and I wish we, we didn't have to well, I'd say to the leader, well, let's do it, right? Let's, let's, let's start, let's drop a bill on the floor instead of a 2,000 page monstrosity that costs X trillions of dollars, that was passed on rules, that's brought to the floor, that we then offer an MTR, and then we go give press conferences about why we can't support it. That, that's just no way to actually do the work of the people. Let's drop a bill here on the floor that starts with the shelf, like the NDAA last week. Let's just put a bill here on the table, and then let's offer amendments, right? We had a whole fight about draft our daughters, about vaccine mandates, all these things. Well, just start with the NDAA and then offer some amendments. Let the votes work. Let the people speak. Chip, you're a heretic. I am. <laughs> I am. Look, um, I, before I leave you, I'm still hopeful. I think there's a path that saves us. But the window for that escape is getting very narrow. It's shrinking. The speed of debt accumulation, the unwillingness to deal with complex problems, with complex <laughs> solutions, because that's reality, is closing fast on us. And the number of members who are like you, who are willing to come to the floor and say very difficult things that are truthful, they're becoming rarer. So, well, thank I you. I appreciate the gentleman. Thank you for the colloquy trip. Yes, sir. God bless you. I'll see you next week.